for the first time they have been brought into international cooperation, a very innovative and productive way of working and engaging Russia. Do you think that science should have a special place in this cooperation? Absolutely. And you know, Norway as a coastal state doing multifaceted resource management, science is key. Uh, so I think both in the way we determine um, energy exploration, do we have the knowledge? Do we have the knowledge of security to engage in new waters? You know, Norway has gradually gone north from the southern part of the Northern Sea up to the Barents Sea. So I think we are into a region where there is a lot we don't know. If you ask people who are experts on oceans and climate change, I think they give very credible answers when they say there is a lot we don't know. We have to invest in that knowledge. And what we see from a Norwegian perspective is that, for example, Svalbard, which used to be a mining community, is now a little bit of mining, a lot more of tourism, and a substantial degree of research. It has, it is evolving into a European and global resource a research station, uniquely placed with this infrastructure to observe climate change, um, all kind of um, uh, cl climatic and, and, and uh, other kind of observations. So this is very challenging, very, very exciting actually. We are now uh, been through the um, uh, international polar year of uh, polar research uh, and we have to take with us uh, a large body of new knowledge and a large body of new challenges to hand over to our scientists to continue working on. Are you confident there's sufficient equipment and training to deal with the issues of the high north? Well, as I said, you know, th none of these challenges are only military, they are civil military. So we have to look at our capabilities both from the civilian side and the military side. For example, in terms of surveillance, surveillance which is needed to manage these large ocean areas which are now opening up, we cannot only count on military surveillance, we also have to in include civilian surveillance, meteorological surveillance, for example, bring that together. We run a project now on a, on a kind of testing level called the Barents Watch, which is about, you know, how can we put these observation resources together to get the complete picture of activities in this ocean, in this uh, large area. If there's an accident, where is the closest search and rescue uh, facility? where are the currents going, and so on and so forth. Military-wise, I would say that, you know, again, let me just stress that there are no military answers to the challenges and risks we are facing. They are political, and we need to tailor our answers to the character of those challenges. But in line with increased presence, increased activity, increased traffic in the areas, I would approach that from a Norwegian perspective to see we have to be present militarily accordingly. So our new main capability, five new brand new frigates, which are able to operate in large sea areas, increase stability in this region, not because they are military with a military mandate, but because they have capabilities of being present. And I think what we need to discuss inside NATO is how do we you know, pool our resources, our perspectives and our capabilities, simply to be able to be there and manage, keep stability and keep what is also always NATO's uh, task, deterrence that we are able to deter what we don't want to see. Is there a danger that more military hardware in the region may be misconstrued by other nations and therefore lead to a response to that increase? Well, let, 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 let us start with that other nation, which is Russia. Uh, they have a large capability in the north. They always had it, strategic capability. They are now modernizing their fleet, modernizing their planes, resuming their activity. We don't see this primarily as something directed towards a single group of countries or a single country. But it is a way for Russia to bring back their presence. So we have to follow that very carefully and we have to respond, I think, accordingly. But not by kind of spiraling up uh, potential for military confrontation because there are no military solutions to the challenges we are facing. And I profoundly believe that most of what Russia wishes to achieve in its part of the Arctic will largely profit from cooperation and low tension. Uh, but as you said, you know, in order in all these settings to avoid misunderstandings, you need to expand communication uh, and, and, and have no illusion. But you know, if you expand communication, you get a better uh, foundation for your own analysis, for your own knowledge of how the other side may think. In terms of that dialogue, the agreement in Ilulisat uh, last year clearly seems like a first step, uh, but do you think that's enough for a sustainable understanding? Well, you know, that was 
a one-off where the five coastal states, which don't have a particular institution for, the, for, the, for themselves, they came together because they are coastal states. It has significance that five foreign ministers of coastal states express themselves you know, in concert on such an issue. But uh, we did not come together in an institution or in the body, we came together in a one-off as coastal states. Then we are bringing the Elulisat statement with us to our parliamentarians, to our national uh, political settings and also to the Arctic Council uh, to anchor. And you know, I have been very focused on saying that you know we're not going to have an exclusive forum of the coastal states only. We would like to preserve the role of the Arctic Council. So you will see Ilulisat emerge there. But Ilulisat is basically about reiterating the importance of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and also stipulating that we will develop rules and regulations and policies on that basis. It was said by the Finnish Nobel Peace Prize winner Marti Artisari that the further north you go, the less problems you have. Now that the high north has been found to have many rich resources, do you think that that still holds true? I think that's an optimistic statement that I would like to share. Uh, I'm always cautious because I think we have to be you know, pragmatic and realistic about it. No illusions about what you know, human competition can, can lead to. But I think what, what, what Marti Artisari is pointing at is an experience. And I, you know, I have always experienced that working in the Barents Sea Council, in the Arctic Council, in these regional settings in the north, we are making a lot of progress. We are you know, somehow able to operate pragmatically on cross-border issues, enhancing economic, uh, scientific, environmental cooperation and not drawing that onto some kind of large-scale geopolitical uh, disputes. Uh, and maybe that is, you know, linked to the fact that, you know, up in the north, things are serious, they are cold, you have to act with a certain kind of dedication to get things done. We all make that shared experience, you know, and I always have a great respect for Russia for its Arctic history. Russia is the biggest Arctic nation in terms of its coastline with a long and proud Arctic explorer history. So, you know, let us approach Russia on Arctic issues from that perspective, but again, with no illusions about them safeguarding their interests. But the, the challenge coming back to all of this is that, as I said, there is high time we discuss the high north with low tensions and uh, the potential of seeking uh, cooperation, agreement and moving forward together should satisfy the interest of all, actually. And that is not something you say to be rosy about things, but I think it is a correct observation of how things stand. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you.